on World News Tonight. Allegations answered. India's Modi says he will look into assassination claims if he is provided with evidence. Protest dispersed. Pakistani authorities arrest hundreds and fire tear gas as female-led demonstrations breach capital. Renewed warning. North Korea's leader again threatens use of nukes as he praises troops for long-range missile launch. And lights up. France's festive illuminations will shine along its famed avenues from the Eiffel Tower to the Champs-Élysées. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We're starting off tonight as Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi broke his silence on the assassination plot claims leveled by the US. Prime Minister Modi has said that India will investigate any evidence provided regarding an alleged plot to kill a Sikh separatist in the United States. The US Justice Department last month charged an Indian citizen with plotting to assassinate a Sikh separatist leader on US soil, alleging an Indian government official was also involved in the planning. India's foreign ministry had earlier said that it set up a high-level inquiry committee to look into all the relevant aspects of the matter. Canada and India had a major diplomatic row after Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in September linked New Delhi to the June killing of the Canadian citizen Harzeeb Singh Nijar, who also is a Sikh separatist. And New Delhi called the Canadian allegations absurd. Modi's comments come after the White House said it was treating an alleged plot to assassinate a Sikh separatist in the United States with utmost seriousness and had raised the issue with the Indian government. In a year-end interview, Trudeau said the U.S. indictment appeared to have softened the Modi government's stance towards Canada. And Modi has said that India was deeply concerned about the activities of certain extremist groups based overseas, adding that these elements under the guise of freedom of expression have engaged in intimidation and incited violence. Pakistani police fired tear gas and water cannons to disperse female-led protests in Islamabad today. At least 200 people were arrested, including protest leader Maharang Balok, as they entered the capital. Protesters have been marching across the country for weeks against alleged enforced disappearances of men in Balakistan province. This was sparked by the death of a Balok man who relatives allege was shot dead while in police custody. The protesters were prevented from entering the red zone, which houses executive, judicial and legislative buildings in Islamabad, by police officers bearing batons and wearing protective headgear. Such allegations have been made for decades, dating back to the birth of the Balochistan nationalist movement in early 2000s. Over the years, many Baloch women have sought justice for their missing loved ones and to bring the issue to global attention. The protesters are demanding an end to enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings as well as accountability for those involved in the alleged extrajudicial killings of the Baloch youth. The protesters are determined to continue the protest without stopping saying that they are peaceful protesters and we will remain peaceful even if the authorities are not peaceful to them. <music> Latest U.S. election updates on the road to the White House now. After the historic ruling by Colorado's top court disqualifying Donald Trump from appearing on the state's primary ballot, Republican rivals of the former U.S. president for the party's 2024 presidential nomination were quick to express their opposition. Republican rivals of former President Donald Trump for the party's 2024 presidential nomination were quick to express their opposition to Tuesday's Colorado Supreme Court ruling, barring him from the ballot in the state's presidential primary. Longshot candidate Vivek Ramaswamy made his views clear on the social media platform X shortly after the decision came out. I will withdraw, I pledge to withdraw from the Colorado GOP primary ballot unless and until tr Trump's name is restored. Even former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, a vocal Trump critic, told a New Hampshire audience that only the voters should prevent Trump from becoming president. Colorado's top court ruled 4-3 to three that Trump is disqualified from appearing on the state's ballot under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which bars anyone engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding federal office. 
The historic ruling cited his role in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol by his supporters and makes him the first ever presidential candidate deemed ineligible for the White House under this constitutional provision. Trump's campaign called the decision undemocratic. A dissenting opinion from one of the judges said Trump is being deprived of his right to due process, noting that a jury has not convicted him of insurrection. Duke University Associate Professor of History Adrienne Lentz-Smith agrees. That part of me that feels like the law has to work the way it should as opposed to the way that I want it to says, if he hasn't been convicted of anything, I may know that he's, you know, a skunk, but like the judge doesn't get to or the justices don't get to make that call. Again, they have to respond to the evidence, not their emotion. Trump vowed to appeal the ruling to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Colorado court said it would delay the effect of its decision until at least January 4th, 2024, to allow for an appeal. Over in Argentina, libertarian president Javier Milei signed a decree outlining economic reforms, including an end to limits on exports plus measures to loosen regulations as his new government combats a severe economic crisis. Argentina's new president is taking sweeping action on the economy. On Wednesday, Javier Milei signed a decree setting out over 300 reforms. The decree of necessity and urgency that we are presenting today is intended to begin the process of economic regulation that Argentina so badly needs in order to start growing. He went on to set out the list. It includes an end to limits on exports and moves to loosen regulations. There are also plans to privatise state-owned companies. The changes are already proving divisive, with thousands of Argentines protesting outside the Congress building in Buenos Aires after Millet signed the decree. Earlier protests demanded more help for the poor as austerity measures kick in. Since taking office earlier this month, Millet has vowed to deliver on a promise of shock therapy for the economy. That will include deep spending cuts to help tame triple-digit inflation. His government has also devalued Argentina's peso currency by over 50% in a bid to help exporters. Yo, Javier Gerardo Milei. The libertarian won power on a pledge to end the country's long economic slump and root out corruption. He wants to slash bureaucracy and shrink the state. It's already clear that that process won't come without drama. Israel-Hamas war updates now. The head of Hamas has held talks in Egypt over another potential ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. This comes following the United Nations delaying votes on a ceasefire due to negotiations with the US. 300 targets in 24 hours as urgent negotiations carried on at the UN, Israel pressed on in Gaza. Its bombardment of Rafa next to the Egyptian border interrupting a live broadcast. An airstrike hitting three homes and a mosque, this child crying for his injured mother. The Hamas-run health ministry saying 20,000 people have now been killed in Gaza. Yet a ceasefire is still off the table. A United Nations vote delayed for a third day. The latest draft resolution called for the return of hostages and urgent and extended humanitarian pauses and corridors throughout the Gaza Strip. America's objection, once again, there was no mention of Hamas. How can it be that there are no demands made of the aggressor and only demands made of the victim? The head of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, left his Doha home for talks in Cairo, a sign momentum may be building for a possible truce. But Hamas has been publicly insisting on a permanent ceasefire before any hostages are freed. While Benjamin Netanyahu told Israelis the war will continue until Hamas is eliminated. And a prominent show of support from overseas, comedian Jerry Seinfeld flying to Israel to meet survivors of the October 7 attack. You are on a better note, so thank you so much for that. And I'm proud of that too. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. We have some good news for you. 
With thousands dying from sudden cardiac arrest every year, scientists are now building the world's largest heart registry in Australia to close the gap by finding patterns and preventing deaths. The pain of losing her husband Brian is still very raw for Jessica Maris. Little did they know these would be his last words. Just as I was getting Avery from the bassinet, Brian reached out to me and, and he took my hand and, and he said, I love you. And um, I gave him a kiss on his forehead and I said, I love you too. The super fit A-grade cyclist was only 31. Jess was feeding her baby daughter at the time of his sudden death. Brian didn't wake up. You don't expect something like this to happen in your home. Each year, 25,000 Australians experience a cardiac arrest in the community. And disturbingly, in about 30 to 40 per cent of cases, doctors can't explain the cause. 90 per cent of those 25,000 will not survive. If you're young, it's more likely that no answers will be found. Australian scientists, with the support of the Heart Foundation, are trying to bridge that gap, using information from ambulance and forensics to set up a database recording each cardiac arrest across all ages. This registry, the Codex Registry, is going to really be the largest in the world that has complete details on every case. Jess was told Brian may have had a genetic condition, Brugada syndrome, causing fast, irregular heartbeats, which their son has inherited. Now we can do the right things to try keep him safe. My wish is that it doesn't take losing a loved one to be able to find out that your family is at a greater risk of a cardiac arrest. Now a sign of easing tensions between the U.S. and Venezuela. The United States freed a close ally of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro in exchange for the release of 10 Americans imprisoned in the South American country and the return of a fugitive defense contractor known as Fat Leonard who is at the center of a massive Pentagon bribery scandal. After months of secret painstaking negotiations, tonight 10 Americans jailed in Venezuela are home. Six of them deemed wrongfully detained, including 38-year-old Savoy Wright, a California businessman arrested in October and held for ransom. And Avon Hernandez, a Los Angeles public defender who was taken into custody last year near the border, accused of being a spy. Venezuela is also sending back a fugitive criminal mastermind American law enforcement authorities have been trying to bring back since he escaped the U.S. last year. Defense contractor Leonard Glenn Francis, also known as Fat Leonard. The man behind a $35 million bribery scheme, the largest corruption scandal in U.S. military history. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to using prostitutes, luxury travel and cash to bribe U.S. naval officers to steer lucrative contracts to his companies. A scheme he described in an interview for an investigative podcast produced by Project Brazen in 2021. Everybody was in my pocket. I had them in my palm. I was just rolling them around. <laughs> Just three weeks before his sentencing last year, Francis, under house arrest, staged a stunning escape, cutting off his ankle monitor. After weeks on the run, he was finally captured in Venezuela. In exchange for Francis and the 10 Americans, the U.S. is granting clemency to Alex Saab, a top ally of Venezuela's authoritarian president, Nicolas Maduro. Saab was arrested in 2020 for money laundering. Today, the two men back together at the presidential palace. Yet another warning from North Korea now as the regime's leader Kim Jong-un firmly stated he would use nuclear weapons to retaliate against a nuclear attack coming from what he calls an enemy. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has expressed his position that if North Korea faces a nuclear attack, it will retaliate with nuclear weapons. The North Korean Central News Agency reported on Thursday that Kim made the statement while encouraging the regime's intercontinental ballistic missile unit on Wednesday. This follows a Hwasong-18 ICBM launch drill on the 18th. Kim also said that the North dignity, sovereignty and national interest could be firmly guaranteed only through strong power. He said having the capability for preemptive attacks and a solid combat readiness is important to ensure genuine defense and steadfast peace. Kim Jong-un's sister Kim Yo-jong, 
who is also the vice department director of the Walker's Party Central Committee, also criticized the recent United Nations Security Council discussion on the North ICBM provocations. In a statement, she expressed regret that the meeting focused only on North Korea's self-defense rights while overlooking provocations from South Korea and the United States. Meanwhile, South Korea and the United States have decided to add nuclear operations exercises to Uti Freedom Shield, the joint military drills scheduled for August next year. The decision was made during the second South Korea and U.S. nuclear consultative group meeting held in Washington, D.C. on December 15th. On Wednesday, second joint trilateral aerial military exercise by Seoul, Washington and Tokyo included a U.S. B-1B strategic bomber marking its 13th deployment to the Korean Peninsula this year. Moving on to tech updates next. Imagine a car scratch or a screen scratch that can repair itself, because this is precisely what researchers in South Korea are working to make possible. Let's take a look. Scientists are testing a newly developed self-repairing material. The new polymer material is transparent and touch functionality remains intact after applying it. The material doesn't scratch easily when rubbed with abrasive material. After cutting the material and applying heat at about 35 degrees Celsius, it rejoins within a minute. It almost returns to its original degree of strength six hours later. Developed by South Korean researchers, the material has overcome previous limitations, showcasing increased transparency and maintaining both strength and restorative capability. The research team created a new hydrogen bonding structure that rapidly repeats the process of breaking and reconnecting within the polymer, enabling the material to self-repair when damaged. The material flows when it becomes soft, especially during summer or at higher temperatures. Six hours is an optimal range that enhances both the characteristics of the material's solidity and the self-healing capabilities. Researchers highlighted the developed material's high transparency and scratch resistance, suggesting its potential utilization as screen protective film. The research team also plans to transform the material into a spray to collaborate with domestic automotive companies and develop a coating material for automobiles. Welcome back. China's quake survivors fear aftershocks and cold weather. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. At least 137 people died, while a dozen people remained missing after a 6.2 magnitude earthquake struck a remote and mountainous area near Gansu in Qinghai provinces in China. Former TV journalist Yekaterina Domstova put her name forward to stand in a Russian presidential election in March that Vladimir Putin is expected to win by a landslide. The blaze in Parkerville, Australia, some 20 miles east of Perth city centre, was declared an emergency level fire before being downgraded by the afternoon. Skopje is one of the most polluted cities in the world. World. One of the contributing factors to dirty air in North Macedonia and the Balkans is the energy system. Supporters of Serbia's opposition protested in Belgrade for the third consecutive day after an election. They say the country's ruling party used fraud to win. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we're leaving you in France as we near this year's Christmas weekend. Paris is showcasing its attractions with lights and decorations. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.